Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, tablets, phones, whatever, can you turn to Exodus, Exodus chapter four? Thank you, Lord. Exodus chapter four. And when you get there, just say amen. 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 <clears throat> I'm just going to open up in a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you. Thank you for your word, Lord, my God. Lord, I ask you today, Lord, <clears throat> that you open every ear today, Lord, to hear what the spirit of God wants to say to each and every person here today, Lord. Open up their ears, open up their hearts, open up their minds, Lord. The same way you did to me, Lord, when you gave me this message in the fast. Father, I pray, Lord, that this word marinates, Lord. I pray that they marinate in this word, Lord, their minds, hearts, souls, Father God, and that they receive it, Lord. They receive it, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Have your way here today, Holy Spirit. Anoint my tongue, my Lord. Anoint my Lord in Jesus' mighty name, my mind right now, Father, that as I release your word, Lord, it is your word, your power, Father, that touches the hearts here today, Father God. Lord, I pray that everyone hears you today. Everyone sees you today, Father. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Exodus chapter 4, and we're going to read the whole chapter. It's 31 verses. Extremely powerful uh, chapter. Amen. I'm just going to start reading. Starting at verse 1. But Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say, the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked them, what is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff, and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it, and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Perform this sign, the Lord told them. Then they will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, really has appeared to you. Then the Lord said to Moses, now put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out again, his hand was white as snow with a severe skin disease. Now put your hand back into your cloak, the Lord said. So Moses put his hand back in. And when he took it out again, it was as healthy as the rest of his body. The Lord said to Moses, if they don't believe you and are, con and are not convinced by the first miraculous sign, they will be convinced by the second one, the second sign. And if they don't believe you or listen to you, even after these two signs, then take some water from the Nile River and pour it out on the dry ground. When you do, the water from the Nile will turn to blood on the ground. But Moses pleaded with the Lord. Oh, Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been. And I'm not now, even though, listen to this, even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue tied and my words get tangled. Then the Lord asked Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether they speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will be with you as you speak and I will instruct you in what to say. But Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else. Then the Lord became angry. Listen to this. The Lord became angry with Moses. All right, he said. What about your brother, Aaron, the Levite? I know he speaks well. And look, he's on, the, he's on his way to meet you now. He will be delighted to see you. Talk to him and put the words in his mouth. I will, I will be with both of you as you speak, and I will instruct you both in what to do. Aaron will be your spokesman to the people. He will be your mouthpiece, and you will stand in the place of God for him. Tell him what to say. And take, the, take your shepherd's staff with you and use it to perform the miraculous signs I have shown you. So Moses went back home to Jethro, his father-in-law. Please let me return to my relatives in Egypt, Moses said. I don't even know if they are still alive. Go in peace, Jethro said. Jethro replied. Before Moses left Midian, the Lord said to him, return to Egypt, 
for all those who wanted to kill you have died. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and headed back to the land of Egypt. In his hand, he carried the staff of God. And the Lord told Moses, when you arrive back in Egypt, go to Pharaoh and perform all the miracles I have empowered you to do. But I will harden his heart so he will refuse to let the people go. Then you will tell him, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. I command you, let my son go so he can worship me. But since you have refused, I will now kill your firstborn son. On the way to Egypt, at a place where Moses and his family had stopped for the night, the Lord confronted him and was about to kill him. But Moses' wife, Zipporah, took a flint knife and circumcised her son. She touched his feet with the foreskin and said, now you are a bridegroom of blood to me. When she said a bridegroom of blood, she was referring to the circumcision. After that, the Lord left him alone. Now the Lord had said to Aaron, go out into the wilderness to meet, to meet Moses. So Aaron went and met Moses at the mountain of God, and he embraced him. Moses then told Aaron everything the Lord had commanded him to say. And he told them about the miraculous signs the Lord had commanded him to perform. Then Moses and Aaron returned to Egypt and called all the elders of Israel together. Aaron told them everything that the Lord told Moses. And Moses performed the miraculous signs as they watched. Then the people of Israel were convinced that the Lord had sent Moses and Aaron when they heard that the Lord was concerned, when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen the misery, they bowed down and worshiped. Amen. 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 I know that's a mouthful. There's a lot there. But like the pastor said, you go, you know, you read along. Amen. Amen. The title of this message is Serving God Effectively. Serving God Effectively. Point number one, we need to depend on God's presence and strength to serve him effectively. Moses' story here in Exodus 4 gives us some insight into how to serve God effectively. His first attempt to assume leadership and to take a stand for the Israelites and to relieve them of the oppression, the first, his first attempt was a failure. It was a failure because he, one, he killed the Egyptian soldier. And the failure is that he took the matters into his own hands. So he saw that he can do something and did it. And what he did, he did in his own strength and his own ability, which proven to not be effective, correct? And because of that, he had to flee for his life to the desert of Midian where he would settle down for 40 years, tending sheep, getting married, and having two sons. But then something happened. God appeared to him in a burning bush and called him to return to Egypt to deliver his people out of slavery. This had to be, I know this was, an overwhelming task for an 80-year-old shepherd. So I'm just going to highlight some things that are already against him. 80 years old, when God called him. That's already, he's already up there in age, right? Sometimes we think it's too late for God to use us. You have your proof in the scriptures that it's not. It's never too late. This was overwhelming for an 80-year-old shepherd because he would have to confront the most powerful and dominant king in the world at this time. And Demand that this king releases two about, about two million slaves whose cheap labor was essential to the Egyptian economy. So you have to kind of envision this. He's standing before the, one of the mightiest, the mightiest men at that time, demand, making demands that he let the slaves go that are bringing and making a profit for Egypt. Amen. Now, although the Pharaoh and his men who wanted to kill him were now dead, it was still, it, it, it was still what seemed to be an impossible 
assignment from the beginning. Naturally, this seemed impossible. Not only was he going to play a major part in freeing the Israelites from, from slavery, he had to leave this enormous amount of people, women, children, animals, cattle, right? Through the desert. So I can just imagine all the things that are running through this man's mind, all the things that he must be thinking, all the things he must be questioning about, ask, wanting to know about. Because when God calls us to do something, a lot of times question, our mind begins to race and we begin to ask questions. We begin to doubt. We begin to doubt ourselves and we even doubt the Lord. But thank God he don't call us to a task this big, right? And this challenging. But he does call all of us that who know him, the ones who know him, the ones who are his children to serve him in some way. Right? And he usually calls us to serve in an area that is beyond our natural abilities. Like he did right here. With Moses. Moses says in verse 10, Oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now. Even though you told me, even though you spoke to me, I get tongue tied and my words get tangled. He asked God in verse 13, He says, Send someone else. Send someone else. Send someone else. God, I don't want to do this. God, I can't do this. There's too much against me. I'm not good at what you want me to do. So therefore, I see myself as not qualified. Because I want to serve. You want me to do something I'm not good at. You call me to do something I can't naturally, physically do. He said, I get tongue-tied. Even though you commanded me to go, even though your word says, even though I know what you're saying, send someone else. I can't, I can't do that. I can't do this. Why would God want, want us to do something that we're not good at? So that we're forced because of the circumstance, because that, that whatever we're called to do that we're not good at. So that we can depend, we are forced to depend on him and his strength, not our own. The apostles served the Lord with all of their strength, with all of their hearts. Jesus told them in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. They weren't able to serve God without leaning on him with everything that they are, with, as their source and strength. They knew no other way. Seeking him with every fiber of their being. There were times when they even thought they would not make it and that they would die. If you're able to serve God without needing him desperately, without leaning on him with everything, all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your resources, everything. If you're not able to lean on him and what you're called to do, you might not be called to do what, you, what you're doing. I've never met someone that serves the Lord in their calling and does not have difficulties, that does not have adversaries consistently against them. Amen. They weren't able to serve God without leaning on him as their source of strength, seeking him with everything, with everything that's in us. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, when we, when we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia, we were crushed. Listen to what he said. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond 
our ability to endure. In other words, they couldn't take it no more. And we thought we would never live through it. This is the apostle, the great apostle Paul speaking. We thought we would never live through it. In fact, let's look what verse 9 says. In fact, we expected to die. But look what he says. As a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned, learned to rely on God who raises the dead. They had to learn how to rely on God who raises the dead. How do you learn something? By consistently doing it, right? Consistently going through it. We learn to rely on God. Paul was weighed down with the burden that was so heavy to bear. The scriptures don't specify the specific burden, but we do know that it was heavy enough for him to think that he was going to die, that he wasn't going to make it. God allows us to be thrown in the furnace from time to time, but you have to remember something. He's always in control of the thermostat. He's the one that determines the temperature, the heat in the situation that you're going through. So when things get extremely hot, don't run from him. Don't run away from God, but run to him. He's the one that qualifies us to even fight the good fight of faith. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, it is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Look what he says. Our qualification comes from God. God has to teach us that if we don't rely on his presence and his strength, we can't do anything. We can't do what he's called us to do. We have to be brought to a place of humbleness in order for us to realize our desperate need for God, of God. The only way to build trust is to go through some stuff. It took time for me to trust my wife. I had to go through some stuff with her to know that she got my back, to know that she's there for me. You got to go through some stuff to realize or understand or be shown the only one that matters, the only one who is truly there for you, the only one that is the source of your strength, the author and finisher of your faith. Amen. And you need to know that we are not going to be able to solve every problem. We can't fix everything that's wrong in our lives. We can't mend everything that's broken in our lives. We must learn to not trust ourselves and what we can do in our own strength and ability. The only way to learn that, church, is to be put in a situation that we cannot fix, that we are helpless in. Why? Because we then have no other choice but to go to God. We then have no other way to look but up. Amen. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, to trust in the Lord with all your heart. I like this translation. This is the New Living Translation, the NLT. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do. And he will show you which, which path to take. Amazing. Amen. Amazing. Church, we need God. Amen. You may not know it, but I know it. I need God. Yeah. We need God. We cannot do what we have been called to do without the strength of God that is found in the presence of God. We can't even suffer without God. Amen. We can't. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Listen to the last part of the verse. For apart from me, you can do nothing. 
you can do nothing. Either he calls us to do something that is far beyond our natural strength or ability, or like the apostle Paul and Moses, he shows us our weakness so that we must, absolutely must rely on his word, his presence, his strength to get us through the circumstance, to get us through what we're going through. He doesn't take you around it. He doesn't eliminate it. He takes you through the circumstance so that it can be conquered, so that he can show you that he can do it. You may not be able to do it. In fact, you can't do it, but he can do it. If your weakness is a burden to your life and your walk with God, place it in his hands. Place it in his hands, church. Give it to him. Give the burden to the Lord, like the song said. Give your burdens to God. He will take care of you. We have to drill that into our minds, hearts, our spirit. He will take care of us. Psalm 55, 22 says, Give your burdens to the Lord, and he will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. God has you. He has your life. He wants to be a part of it if he's not currently. We have to depend on God's word. We need to depend on his strength and his presence above every else in our life if God said it that settles it it's done we have to believe that we have to believe the word of the Lord don't question him don't doubt we have to believe the name the word of the Lord amen when those questions arise when the doubt arises like it did to Moses go back to the word go back to the word of God Put away what's going through your mind, what you're feeling. If you can't read, listen to it. Go back to the word of the Lord, church. Amen. We read the scriptures, the Old Testament. We see that all the miracle signs and wonders that were performed. Amen. And that was because they didn't have a physical Bible to go to. Amen. To make sure that it was from the Lord. But now today, church, we have the physical Bible. We have the word of the Lord to always go to, to always go to for questions, for answers, just to get the counsel of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 18, Exodus 3, 18. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Lord told Moses that the elders of, the, of Israel, <clears throat> excuse me, would accept the message that he told them that the Lord had appeared to him and promised to bring them out of slavery in Egypt into the land of Canaan. But in chapter four, Moses asked God, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to, to what I say? But didn't he tell them in chapter three? Didn't he tell them they would accept the message? Didn't God already tell them that they would accept the message that was going, that what they would, the message that he was going to deliver to them? Verse 14 in, in, in chapter um, 4 says, this made God angry. It made God angry. This was the beginning of many doubtful questions that Moses asks God. He's questioning God's integrity. Certain questions question the integrity of the Lord when he specifically clarifies it in his word. Amen? Amen. In other words, God, will you really keep your word? Moses is saying, he's pretty much, that's what he's saying, because God already told him. Will you really keep your word, God? Do you think that some of our excuses, like Moses's, get God angry? How about that? How about that one? Yeah. If it got the greats in the Bible, if, if, if what they did got God angry, do you think our excuses get God angry? <clears throat> That's a legitimate question, right? I'm sure, I'm sure that they do. 
I'm sure I've upset God many, many, many times. I can understand. I can actually understand where Moses was coming from. Because it had been about 400 years since anyone, any Israelite had heard a word from God. God was silent for so long. He was silent for so long. As is God silent in your situation? Is God silent in what you're dealing with right now? Sometimes silence stirs up a lot of different emotions, right? Silence sometimes says more than words, right? Anytime you experience silence, you always go to the word of the Lord. Always go to the word of the Lord because it's not God that's always silent in our case. Sometimes we're not in a place, a position to hear what he's saying. God gives Moses three signs to stir up and strengthen his faith along with those that would witness the miraculous signs, as he mentioned. The first was this, the, the turning of the staff into a serpent. The second was making his hand full of leprosy and then back to normal again. And the third was turning the water from the Nile into blood. God asked Moses, what is that in your hand? Remember, God never asks the question because he lacks information. <laughs> what is that in your hand? Moses said, it's a staff. The Lord told him. Like the scripture says, throw it on the ground. And it became a snake. Then the Lord told Moses, grab it by the tail. Moses obeyed. And the snake became a staff in his hands as he picked it up. The snake, why he had Moses do this? Because the snake was a symbol of Egyptian power that was on the crown of the king, of the pharaoh. By changing Moses' staff into a snake and backed into a snap, the Lord was showing Moses that as he, only a shepherd, right? As he, an 80-year-old shepherd, obediently depended on God's power, he would have dominion over the oppressor of God's children. And of course, we know where the serpent's from. The serpent goes back to the garden, amen, as the enemy of God, right? And, that, and those that in his image. Ultimately, the seed of the woman, which is Christ, would crush the head of the serpent, who would then later bruise his heel. God was showing him, even though that mighty king is powerful and he has a massive, massive military. Amen? Amen. Not only am I sending you there to make demands to let my firstborn go, the Lord said. I'm sending you there to show you and everyone else that I am more powerful than that king. I am more powerful than that military. I am the one that is the I, the great I am. I am the author and finisher of your faith. Amen? Amen. I love how God always motivates, not motivate, God always wants us and then motivates us through us seeking him to do what seems impossible. This was what seemed an impossible assignment to go into a kingdom and demand from a king the release of the people, almost 2 million people that he had working for them, release them. That says a lot. And sometimes we have a problem with our call, ministering, preaching the gospel, whatever the God has called you to do. Point number two, to serve God effectively, we must be obedient to his word. To serve God effectively, we must be obedient to his word. <clears throat> God was showing Moses that which is common and impotent in and of itself becomes powerful when yielded in obedience to a mighty God. Jesus also taught the same concept when he commanded the disciples to feed the 5,000. 
in Mark chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. The feeding of the 5,000 wasn't naturally possible. Given they only had five loaves of bread and two fish, right? That's what the scriptures say. This was an impossible command from the Lord Jesus. Jesus said to them, to the disciples, give them something to eat. Give the multitude, give the 5,000, give them something to eat. They said we would have to work for months to have enough money, to buy enough food, to feed all these people. But Jesus asked them something. How many loaves do you have? This question is parallel to the question that God asked Moses. What is in your hand? What is in your hand? After telling Jesus that they only had five loaves and two fish, Andrew asked the obvious question in John chapter 6, verse 9. What good is that with this big crowd? What good is what you have in this crowd? What good is five loaves and two fish in this, with this crowd? In other words, it's impossible to feed this many people with what we have. Some of us might be saying to ourselves, I can't do, I can't do what God has called me to do because of the issues I have, because of what I'm going through. I can't be used like this. I said that to the Lord in this fast. I said, I can't be used like this. I'm not doing it. I told him. That's when he had to humble me. He humbled me real quick, real quick. I got humbled. And I started preparing this message. I said, God, what good can I be in this state? How can I effectively serve you with these issues and other issues that I have? going on. How can I serve you effectively, God? That's what Moses was saying. He had every excuse in the book. Every excuse. The point that I'm trying to make is that the ordinary and impotent, like I said, becomes sufficient and powerful when we yield it in obedience to God. Obedience to God is where your need is met. The meeting of a need, listen, is not dependent on the supply in hand. But on the blessing of God that rests on the supply. The Lord's ability to feed the 5,000 did not depend on how many loaves of bread or how many fish were in the basket. But on his blessing resting on the disciples and their resources because they responded out of faith, out of obedience. Jesus told them what to do. And guess what they did? They did it. Your blessing, our blessing, or our breakthrough does not depend on what you're going through. It does not depend on what you're thinking. It especially does not depend on what you are feeling. If God has called you to do something, do it. Be obedient to the call of God in your life and do it. Your consistent obedience to the, in doing what God has called you to do will eventually reap a breakthrough and blessing just as his people, Israel, his firstborn, Israel. They had been in bondage in Egypt for hundreds of years, but now through Moses, God would relieve their suffering. God said to Moses that the elders, the elders, see when they see the first two miraculous signs, and if they still don't believe, he's going to give them a third. And he had to take the water from the Nile, put it on the ground so that it can turn to blood. The Nile was their main source of water for everything. Performing this miracle in front of everyone, especially their Israelite elders, showed them that the mighty power of Egypt was no match for their God. Church, what you are experiencing is no match for your God. It's not. It's no match to your God. 
in comparison to power, it's powerless to God in comparison with the Lord. Only power it has is when we give it. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Something that consistently grows sometimes and gets worse is something we're consistently feeding. Amen? Amen. Whatever has been effectively disrupting your life and your walk with God, it's no match for God. Say, say it. It's no match for God. No it's God. no match for God. Amen. <clears throat> it's no match for him. He was able then. He's still able now, yeah. church. You might be thinking to yourself, okay, good. This sounds great, but God hasn't done any miracles for me. I haven't seen no miracles like these people have seen, like Moses. Of course, if I saw a miracle like Moses, I'd do it too. That's what we constantly say, right? If I see it, I'll do it too. But he has. He has performed a miracle in our lives. We're too focused on what we don't have. What we, we're focused on what we're lacking. We're focused on what we're in need of too much and for too long. So much so that we overlook what we already have and what God has already done and is currently doing. Amen. <clears throat> he has given us, church, the inspired word of God. We have the most powerful words, the most powerful book in history. We have the very words of God at our fingertips that is filled with miracles, that is filled with signs, that is filled with wonders to show us his mighty power. We have been given the most reliable testimony of the most powerful miracle ever in history to this day. And that's the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ from the dead. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 19, was so certain of this that he was willing to rest the entire Christian faith on the truth that Jesus was physically raised from the dead. The only reason that any of us can serve God effectively, church, and proclaim the gospel of Christ is because of his extended mercy, his extended grace to the believer, to, one, to, to the ones that believe in the Son of God, Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. When God calls you to do something, anything, even if it's beyond your natural ability, don't make excuses as to why you cannot or should not do it. Do it. Do it. <clears throat> God has given Moses confirmation here <clears throat> that if he trusts in the God's power, that if he trusts him, that the Pharaoh will not be able to stand against him. But Moses says, I'm not good with words. I'm not good with words, Lord. Lord, I'm not good with words. I never have been. And I'm not now even though the word says it, even though you spoke it to me, I still get tongue-tied. My words get tangled. God, you understand how I feel. You know what I'm dealing with. God understands completely, church, but he doesn't tolerate disobedience. You have to understand that. He will not. He cannot tolerate disobedience. And if we're not doing what we're called to do, guess what? We're sinning. Amen. Amen. He that knows what to do and does not do it to him is sin. Amen. And what is sin? Disobedience. So we know what we're supposed to do. We may not be disobedient in all these other areas. <clears throat> we may not be a thief. We may not be a murderer. But if we're not doing what we have been called to do, we're being disobedient. <clears throat> He does not, God does not tolerate disobedience. Why? Because God knows exactly who is behind our disobedience. Amen? <clears throat> Amen. 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 says this. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. Listen, he is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. That's to the believer. God reminded Moses that he's the one who makes a man's mouth. Amen. He's the one that can make a man, a person, mute or deaf. Amen. He's the one that gives sight. Amen. Or takes it away. But God says something. After Moses gave him an excuse, after excuse, after excuse, and it, 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 brought, me, it brought me back to me. And I started reflecting in the mirror. <clears throat> And <clears throat> he said, go. Now go. In other words, I know what you're dealing with. And it's real. I know it's real. But I still called you to do something. In spite of your handicap, in spite of what you cannot do. Amen? Amen. Even though you have these problems, Moses, I've called you to let go, to stand before the Pharaoh, to set my people free. Amen. Even though we have issues in life, church, some physically, some mentally, some financially, we all have issues. Regardless of the issue, amen, do what God has called you to do. Whatever he called you to do, obey it. Obey it. Put him in the front of your life instead of the problems. Amen? Give him authority over your life instead, instead of the issue. Give him full reign. Allow the spirit of God to guide, to guide you, to direct you instead of your problem, instead of the issue. He said, go. And no, I will be with you as you speak. I will instruct you on what to say. After God promises Moses that he would be with him, he still told God to send someone else. You see, he's just like us. He's just like us. Regardless of all the excuses, God still wanted him to do what he called him to do. And he even gave him a helper, his brother Aaron. To be his mouthpiece. But I want you to see something here. He gave him a helper to be his mouthpiece. But Moses still had to relate the message to Aaron. So therefore, he still was doing it. Because he still had to relate the message to his brother. His brother. Didn't make sense to me, but... <clears throat> when God calls us to do something beyond our strength and our ability, his presence and power are sufficient, church, and can move the biggest of mountains if we walk this walk in obedience. If we remain obedient <clears throat> to God and the call in our life, instead of an Aaron to assist us in our ministry, we have someone far more reliable, we have someone far more powerful and is powerful. It's, he is the Holy Spirit. And he is the one who gives us the strength to get through any and everything that we face, that we feel in life. He is the one who gives us the words when we don't know what to say or even pray. He is the one that brings to our remembrance what we have deposited in our spirit. You're not going to remember something you don't know. Amen. We have to take the word, eat it, eat it. And then the spirit will bring to our remembrance what we read at the right time. <clears throat> don't make up excuses for why you can't serve God effectively. <clears throat> and this was to me. Remember, when someone delivers a message, it's always for them first. Amen. No more excuses. No more excuses. 
to, to, to not serve God effectively or why we can't serve God currently. Many, uh, many, uh, many people use their problems. And I understand they're difficult situations. But as we see through the, script, through the scriptures, when he calls us to do something, he's very precise that we do it. And walk in obedience, amen? Because your need is going to be met in the actual walking in obedience. Amen? amen? He is the one that will give you strength as you are walking in obedience to get through whatever it is you're facing. Whatever it is you're going through. He's the one that sees us through, church. Don't use, don't use your problems. Let's not use our problems, amen, any longer to not serve God effectively. No more. We cannot, right? We can't do, we can't be and do who, or be who, and we can't be who God has called us to be and do what he has called us to do effectively without us walking in obedience, amen? When serving God effectively, we are absolutely positively going to face, we are going to encounter many, 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 many difficulties. How many know that? Many difficulties, some that will seem impossible, some that will hurt, some that will take time to get over. Don't resist the Lord any longer. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we say we're not resisting him, but when we're not doing what we're called to do, we're resisting him. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Let's be obedient to the call of God in our life. When I say effectively, serving God effectively, I'm referring to serving the Lord obediently and faithfully, regardless of our problems, regardless of any ailments, regardless of whatever we're feeling. Amen? God had an assignment for Moses. He didn't say to Moses, okay, Moses, when you feel like doing what I've called you to do, I'll be here waiting for you. All right? Listen to this. As Moses was heading back to Egypt, God met him. God met him on the way. Guess why God met him? Because God was going to kill him. God was going to kill him for being disobedient. I showed you that the Lord does not agree with disobedience. God was going to kill him for being disobedient. Moses' wife, Zipporah, had to take a knife and circumcise one of their sons and throw the foreskin at Moses' feet. And she said, as we read, you are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. And because of that, God left them alone. Because now they reacted, out of, they responded with, through, through obedience. Moses was disobedient to the Lord when he didn't circumcise their second son in honor of God's covenant that he made with Abraham in Genesis 17. He was disobedient. And because of his disobedience, God was going to kill him. God was going to kill him. Through this incident, God was teaching Moses that if he was going to serve him, he had to obey him. Even if those closest to him may have objected. Even if ones closest to us object or disagree, which many, many times that's the case. Moses learned that to serve God effectively, he had to depend on God's presence and his strength while obeying him. We have to depend on the word of God, church. Even if that means going against our loved ones. We always have to choose Christ above everyone and everything in our lives. And sometimes we're going to have to take a stand for what is true against what those we love. Above all else, and I'm going to close with this. Sometimes we have to say, 
to our relatives, to our people, whoever is the closest one in your circle. I love you. I love you, but I love Jesus more. And if I do this with you, if I engage in this conversation any further with you, I will be disobedient to my Lord, my God. Amen. Now, you don't have to verbally say that, ver uh, say that to say that to them, but you have to remind yourself of that and not go any further. Amen. Amen. I love God more and I choose to obey him first. Don't compromise your walk with God, church, for anyone or for anything. If we can stick to the word of God and filter everything through the word of God and make decisions based on the word of God, our feelings will no longer control us. Amen? <clears throat> our feelings will no more, no longer dominate our lives because it's so easy to feel a certain way because especially if it's a physical ailment because it pre prevents you from doing certain things amen but if you go against what you feel and just dive into the word of God and rely on his strength and his power as you keep on seeking him as you keep on knocking as you keep on asking you will receive you will receive the strength of God to see you through. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> the power of the Holy Spirit will see you through. He doesn't eliminate certain issues, which I wish a lot of times he would. I know a lot of us do, right? But I know that I know that I know that I know that Jesus is Lord. And regardless of what I go through, he's still Lord. I'm happy. He's Lord. I'm sad. He's Lord. I feel great. He's Lord. I feel bad. He's Lord. I lose a loved one. He's Lord. My kids don't want to speak to me. He's Lord. He's still God. Take the problems and anyone that may be on that throne and put God back on it. Amen. Amen. And let's walk this walk effectively being obedient to the call of God on our life, not giving God any more excuses, no more excuses, but serve him. Try, just try. Amen? Let's stand. God is so good. Amen. <clears throat> He's so awesome. He's so awesome. <clears throat> Stay in the word of God, church. Stay in the word of God. <clears throat> Especially those who came up for prayer that the pastor prayed for, that are dealing with that, spirit, that certain spirit. Yeah. Amen? Stay in contact, in connection with the word of the Lord. That spirit is meant to do one thing. Take you out. Right. Amen? Amen? I've been dealing with that spirit for over 30 years. Almost over 30 years. It's, it's powerful. Stay in connection with God, the source of your strength. Amen. He is the one that will give you a sound mind. He is the one that offers a peace, a peace like never before. Amen. A peace that surpasses all understanding. A peace that at times does not make sense because it gets so overwhelming. We get so overwhelmed with the peace of God in our circumstance, amen? And it makes no sense because we feel the peace of God while hell is breaking loose. Right. Amen. But the peace right. of God that surpasses all understanding, I pray that it rests on your minds, on your hearts, on your souls, amen? I pray that the word of God pierces your heart, pierces your mind. Amen? Amen. Father, I just thank you, Lord. I thank you for everyone here and online, Lord. Lord, I first pray, Lord, for an edge of protection upon all of our minds, Lord, upon all of our hearts, Lord. Lord, I pray, Father, 
for strength, my Lord. I pray, Father, in Jesus' mighty name, that everyone here, Lord, and those online will receive the strength of the Lord, Father, if they are serving you, my Lord, ineffectively by not being obedient, I pray, Lord, that they're brought to a place of humbleness where they can repent, Lord, and give their lives back to you and dedicate everything that they are to you, Lord, so that you, Lord, will hear their cries and heal their land. Father, I pray that we can all walk in obedience and serve you effectively, Lord. I pray that we no longer have excuse after excuse after excuse, Father, but that we put them all to the side, Lord, because they do not matter, Lord. What matters is you, Lord. What matters is the kingdom of God, Lord, and your righteousness. Yeah. Lord, help us seek first the kingdom of God and all your righteousness, Lord. Father, I pray for strength, for courage, Lord. I pray for them, Lord, and I ask, Lord, to give them a courage like no other. So step into the call of God in their life. So step in, Lord, what you've called them to do, Father. Strengthen them in their call, Lord. Strengthen them in their call. I pray for consistency, Lord, in the walk, in, in their walk, Father. I pray that they can remain consistent and persistent, Father God in their walk, Lord, in their seeking, their knocking, their asking. Lord, I pray that they never grow weary for doing what is right. Lord, bless them, keep them, comfort them, even correct them, Father. Love on them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.